Hey everybody, I'm Dave Sandell. And I'm Caleb Carter. And this is the Best Album 4 Podcast, a podcast where we talk about the best album for a new year, a brand new year, which we are, as we're recording this, right on the precipice of. <laughs> this is That's probably right. going to come out a little bit after, but so hello from the past. You have time traveled. Yeah, yeah, how's 2024 have, going? <laughs> you have done that uh, Pete and Pete thing we were talking about a few episodes ago, and you are now <laughs> you are now ahead of us, and you have to promise us that it's actually a good year. Yeah, so I I have my skepticism as it's going to be clear by the end of this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so I guess let's start here. We are, you know, we're we're, we're wrapping up 2023. We had a really good 2023 in some respects. We made over 25 episodes of Best Album 4. We had hundreds and thousands of listens and and and, and plays, and that's pretty cool. Thank you for everybody that's who spent fun. some time with us. We have got the message from Spotify that you guys like pop music a lot more than we do. <laughs> so maybe funny. we'll try to lean into that this year. <laughs> it's all that Swifty episode. Damn yeah, it. Man. We should, we should have never <laughs> tuned into the Swifties. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in other ways, it was a really interesting year and sometimes a little bit of a crummy year. Uh, and so as I'm kind of like on the edge of 2024, I find myself with this sort of eternal optimism of this is a new leaf. Everything can be different. Even though all that's happening is we're flipping a page at the calendar. Do you have that same experience or do you kind of go from 2023 to 2024 expecting more of the same? No, I do. I, I, I always have a little bit of stress about the passage of time in general. So like every birthday I have, every new calendar year, in some sense, every month I get a little, I'm like, oh my God, flipping the page of the calendar even. Yeah. I think there's definitely something deeply broken about me in that. <laughs> I'm not going to say that's a healthy thing. So, you know, that's part of my work, Dave, is like stepping back, trying to be present, not stressing about, oh, my God, it's a new year. What have I done with my life? Yeah. Would you say as you look towards 2024 that you are, I guess what I'm asking is your is a version of is your glass half full or half empty? Are you more optimistic or more pessimistic? About waving my arms around all of it. <laughs> You're like gestures broadly <laughs> around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, this also weighed on me heavily when thinking about this topic. Because I I think for next year, I am personally optimistic about like things I have going on in my life. And like broadly looking around at the world. <laughs> I would characterize my feelings as nervous at best (laughs) (laughs) for lots of reasons. Yeah. So it's like when you go in a new calendar year and you're trying to pick an album like we were doing today, I was thinking, do I want to pick something to where I personally am going to resonate with and feel great about? Or am I universalizing the experience of turning into a new year? Because I don't feel like this is a great thing for everyone. You know, like Hmm. there are some people I think who kind of dread what's coming up or fear it. And I think in general, I think my sense is like 70% of people are like new year, new opportunities, new me. I'm going (laughs) to, you know, start on the you know new habit that I Uh, always wanted to try or I'm going to I'm going to finally get in shape, you know, it's all that like ridiculous kind of American optimism about always trying to be better and never kind of just I don't know, settling. And then the other 30% of us are just generally skeptic and cynical and what new hellscape is this year going to bring? <laughs> Yes. And I kind of feel like they're both right. <laughs> Certainly, there are some warning signs about 2024 that should right. not be ignored. But I would say I'm I'm generally optimistic. I'm more optimistic than pessimistic. I have a sense of, at least personally, that some things that have been difficult for a really long time are going to be less difficult, and maybe there's going to be some new opportunities that will be fun to, you know, uh, pursue. And, and so that's that's exciting. That's good. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to turning the the page and and like kind of saying good riddance to 2023, even though 2023 wasn't the worst year in the last five. (laughs) I'm I'm happy to let it go. (laughs) I I keep hearing about a quote from their eyes were watching God. There are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. And I think for everyone I know, 
and I'm not being hyperbolic. I think literally everyone I know, <laughs> 2023 asked more questions than it answered. Yeah. Like how much money will Taylor Swift make this year? That's what you're talking about? <laughs> Those types of questions? Will Taylor Swift single-handedly rescue the economy? <laughs> she did her darndest. And I think that that was actually something that got answered. And the answer was yes. No, I I just feel like everyone's personal life had things going on. We obviously all very much felt nervous about the economy and our personal finances and all that. I just feel like everyone completely, I don't want to say bombed this year, but I've got a lot of friends who are like, 2023, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. <laughs> right. Right. And we are also coming up in a presidential election year. We've got a lot of anxiety and questions about that. So 2024 is going to give us some answers. It's not necessarily going to be the answers we want. I'm not I'm not yeah. confident it's the answers we want, but I am confident there will be some definitive answers. <laughs> yes, there will raise a whole host of new challenges. My my sincere hope is that we make at least 25 more best album fours. That's my that's my big hope go. for 2024. There you go. <laughs> And that uh, will make it a success. Yeah, that's right. That will redeem <laughs> the entire year. It's funny because didn't we start out recording with picking albums for the best album for irrational optimism or something like that? <laughs> oh, for starting a podcast. Yeah, and for we, starting a podcast. <laughs> and I said I was picking an album because of its irrational optimism. <laughs> there you go. Yep. It yep. continues. It continues. So I would say, uh, in general, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day are not holidays that I care much for we don't have like big party plans and it's been a long time since i've wanted to stay up until midnight <laughs> at least like 10 <laughs> or 15 years since i've wanted to stay up till midnight but certainly i still can't get it out of my head that it is meant to be a giant party i haven't mm. been to a giant party in a long time but you know certainly college and, and shortly after college it was a giant party most of the time and i do kind of miss that it feels like it should be out i guess you know in a club or something ringing in the new year. Do you like look forward to the actual like celebration event, eventizing of new year's? I think I do think that I tend to, like we were saying, see it as a new opportunity, you know, to kind of reinvent yourself for better, or for worse. That doesn't translate to me into the actual evening of like, now I need to celebrate it at a party. I don't <laughs> sure. know why, but I've never, I mean, you know, when I was in college and I was younger, like we do the whole staying up to midnight thing. It just feels like kind of tired to me at this point. It's like my kids now want to stay up till midnight and they think it's so cool. And I'm like, I've, I've, I've seen it. You know, there's nothing special. It's just the clock turns. You say happy midnight <laughs> and you go to bed. I don't know. It's, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like the actual turning of the clock mm. really is that impressive. Yeah, that's you know? fair. I also feel like New Year's in general is one of those holidays where everyone just kind of jacks up the prices on everything. <laughs> you know, like it's kind of like Valentine's Day where it's just like this arbitrary day on the calendar is so much more expensive than every other day for no good reason. Yeah, that's kind of what it feels like. So my wife and I, for most of our New Year's celebrations, just picked like another night nearby. <laughs> Like that night, like we'll go two days before or something and go out to a nice dinner and it'll be like our little New Year's Eve celebration. Yeah. Do you convince yourself that it's New Year's Eve? Do you stay up till midnight? We do not do that. We do have a tradition of kind of asking reflective questions about the last year and trying to remember what happened, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah. What would you say uh, as you're, uh, one, one last question, as you're kind of leaving 2023, what brought you the most joy on a regular basis this year? Besides for talking about music with you every week, of course, of course, this genuinely did bring me joy. I mean, I just carve out time to talk about music. What other years have we had that? Heck yeah. Probably haven't done that on such a regular basis since college. So that's definitely brought me joy. What else has brought me joy? I mean, you got the standard things like my wife and kids, but that seems pretty dull. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm going to pull out that clip. I'll send it to your <laughs> wife and kids. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly feel like this year for me was a lot of just like enjoying. How do I don't put this? I've worked really hard for a lot of years to do exactly what I want to do every day. 
Mm. And I kind of feel like this year and to some extent last year, but really more this year kind of has felt like I've capitalized on that and just enjoy where I'm at. Mm. You know? Yeah, that's good. How about you? You know, the thing that brought me the most joy on a regular basis this year, it is learning to cook sushi at home and doing enough times that it doesn't take four hours to put together. Doing it enough times that oh, we can fun. just make it on like a weeknight, <laughs> and it's not, it doesn't have to be like a big meal. We you're can just cooking, like, right? You're like preparing it. You I know, guess the, that's right. I mean, you're you're making the rice and you're preparing, yeah. but you're you're doing a lot of prep. I mean, there's a lot of prep involved with sushi. There is, but yeah. we have learned to kind of do. We call it DIY sushi now. We kind of let everybody make their own rolls, either hand rolls or we help them turn it into kind of a burrito. But, you know, so we your make kids all the do fixings. It? They make their own yeah, thing. They make their oh, own. Oh wow, that's cool. It took them a long time, you know, to kind of get the hang of it, but they've gotten the hang of it now. And I think we have we found some good like family rituals, places that that feel good to our whole family. We found a restaurant finally that all five of us like. You know, we we have figured out kind of what vacations look like for us or you know what if we have some time on a weekend, what feels good. Uh, finding creeks nearby to like look for animals. That seems to be kind of our kid's sweet spot. And it's also relaxing for us. So nice. I think discovering family rituals that, that are working for all five of the members of my family. I think before we Mm. kind of had to do things where at least somebody was annoyed or bored. (laughs) Yeah. And now, and we still have, you know, times that we do that where, you know, one person goes. And then I read a book earlier this year called, how to keep house while drowning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh and uh, that's what Dora was. It was written with people who are, are neurodiverse in mind, uh, but also was speaking directly to people who were just in it and, and having, you know, like essentially living in crisis. And, and that was sort of our year to be candid. And uh, one thing that, that the author said that really changed the way I think about everything is she said, care tasks are gifts to your future self. Oh, that's good. And for some reason, it took like all these things that I, I don't want to do or, or, you know, it's not that I don't want to do them. It's that they are so low on the priority list uh, of things that seem like they have to happen today. Uh, they just felt like chores. <laughs> yep. And now they feel like, hey, if I do this for myself now, it will actually be a gift to me in the future. And, and I have attempted to really integrate that fully into my life this year and it's slow and, you know, there's fits and starts and two steps forward, one step back. Uh, but that piece of advice has, has really stuck with me, me all year long. And then the last thing I want to tell you is I went to the Art Institute and uh, I discovered a painting uh, that I just had not really spent time with or didn't really know about, I guess, until until very recently. And it was actually on the cover, you know, of their little map. They, they you know, seasonally change out which, which piece yeah. is on the map. And for some reason, this piece, uh, when I saw it on the map, it, it just really caught my, my attention, my soul. I'm not totally sure what part of my brain started buzzing. But when I, when I saw it, I was really like taken aback, like my breath kind of was taken away. And, and, and I ended up for my birthday, my, my family got me a print of it that I'm hanging over my desk. And I actually went back to the Institute because the time that I saw it was with my daughter and, and she was kind of racing through. And so I actually went back to the Institute as a way to celebrate my birthday and spent a day there and actually spent like a full half hour just looking at that one painting. Mm. And, and I don't know what happened, but that piece of art, more than anything that I've really encountered visually, has stirred something up in me. And so it, what, what was the piece? It's called The Starry Night and the Astronauts by Alma Thomas. It's in the modern wing if you if you can find it. I'm not sure that you're going to look at it and it's not going to necessarily touch your soul, but for some reason it stirred something up in me. And so if you're in town, <laughs> go check it out. Yeah, I'm looking it up now. Yeah. <laughs> Your your things that brought you joy was really like sparking. I was like, oh God, see if I had had time to think about this, I would have thought about tons of things. Like I, I sure. went backpacking for the first time this year. Like oh yeah. Kind of doubled down on like my outdoorsiness that I've discovered since the pandemic. That was really fun. Like kind of going out of the woods by myself. So really, really spent a lot of time outdoors this year, just uh hmm. doing long hikes, long walks, backpacking. It's really fun. Nice. Yeah. Well, should we get into our topic for the day, our best album for a new year? I think we have to. All right, fair enough, because we're 20 minutes in and this is a music <laughs> podcast. So for my pick, I am going with something that probably seems obvious on the surface, but I, I wanted to I want to get at it from kind of different angles. I chose 
Prince's legendary album, 1999. Obvious on the surface doesn't do it justice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, what was your reaction when I said this to you? You picked like a literal, well, if not the album, the literal song of New Year's Eve, I think. That's right. Like the (laughs) classic song. Let's start there. Is 1999 still a song that makes sense on New Year's? Like, I know it does for us, but for like young people, does it have any meaning or does it feel like an artifact from the past that is nonsense now? I don't, that's tough because how much does Prince resonate with young people right now? Because I, people Mm. of our generation and especially Gen X, like, oh, you are, I guess you are Gen X, technically. I'm like, I'm I'm an exennial. Oh, that's uh, what I am. Out. I think we're yeah. like right, both right there. Anyway, people, people that, of our age love Prince. Think, you know, think very highly of him. Obviously, P- anyone who's into music, but kind of like the average young person. I'm thinking about my son here. Like, yeah, is sure. Prince even on his radar? If you haven't like had parents introduce Prince to you, like that's kind of where I'm. Yeah, struggling is like this. How do you even discover him? Is that what you're saying? Kind of. I mean. I guess you could say that about a lot of musicians from the 60s, 70s, 80s, right? Like you have, you kind of have to go back and discover them. And Prince obviously sure. has such a cultural impact, but I don't know. It's like this music to some extent for the right audience can feel super dated. And then this song is literally dated. <laughs> yes, it has a literal date in the title. <laughs> literally. And, and sounds like the 80s. I mean, and this album was was essentially the template. For yes. all other 80s music, especially new wave music, but this, for most other 80s music that followed it. Yes, this is the 1984 of music. It's the Back to the Future Part 2 of music, <laughs> you know, where it's like anytime you put a date on something and you think it sounds so futuristic and then that date yeah. passes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. like it's going to feel dated, but this song is still a banger. I mean, it's so much fun every time it comes on i get really excited so at least for me it still does it when you were listening to it growing up did 2000 seem like a big deal it felt like a big deal to me like 2000 and this song felt like it was pointing to something even though you know this album comes out in, in the early 80s this this song continued all the way through the 90s to feel futuristic and prescient and you know this is this is a literal soothsayer song (laughs) like he saw the future did that feel that way to you too yes absolutely i mean the year 2000 do you remember that conan o'brien sketch the year 2000 in the year 2000 which again feels so dated now and so (laughs) but i think it was like meant to kind of be you know obviously a little ironic so it does, sure. i think that's okay <laughs> uh, but that's in my head that's what i hear when i think about the year 2000 but like the reason why that was funny is because that's how we all felt about the year 2000 like it felt like the future it's not just everyone who gets to live through the turning of a new millennium right and so i do think there was some very apropos celebration and like oh my god this is the future because that is a pretty big turn of the clock. Like the reason why 1999 feels like you're on the edge of something big. So yeah. to that extent, I think it was warranted. But it feels like so long ago now. <laughs> it does feel like a long time ago. <laughs> and I think the 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 Y2K panic that you and I lived through, essentially being an, an utter thud, <laughs> when like nothing happened. Nothing. And there was so much. I mean, Did you think something was going to happen? Oh my, like, were I you mean, worried so about here's, it? Here's what I would say. From like January through like November, I was really worried about it because everybody was really worried about it. It was on the news all the time and we still watched the news back then. It was on every like magazine cover. Every newspaper was talking about Y2K. There was a Y2K bug. All the banks were going to shut down. Money was going to be worthless. You know, like essentially all records from everywhere were going to be eliminated unless there were paper backups. And we were going to go back to the stone ages where computers didn't even work. And this was kind of now imagining computers not working. Working, I actually don't know how we would function as a society anymore. Yeah, right. But at the time, even it felt like, oh, that's going to be a big deal. A computer stopped working and like never work again. I don't know what exactly we thought was going to happen. But I was definitely in a state of like panic is the wrong word. It was more like I can't wait to see what happens because yeah. I think this is going to be wild. And I was young enough 
I was in college. I was young enough that, you know, I felt invincible. <laughs> and so it didn't feel like anything bad was going to happen to me. It just felt like this is going to be very interesting and, and the whole world is going to go crazy. And that'll be so fun to watch. I think sometime around December, I realized I don't think anything's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. And, and it started feeling really overblown. How I mean, You were a little younger than me. How did it feel to you? Uh, I thought it was dumb. The whole way through? <laughs> the from whole day way one? Through. Oh, wow. The whole way through. <laughs> I was like, this is really stupid. It's going to be fine. This has been overblown. Why were you so sure? I remember showing my parents this because they were like, I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) And I remember going on my little PC at home, whatever we had, and going to like the clock on my computer Uh and literally just changing the date to past the year 2000 and it just being fine. And I was like, so you're telling me that my computer is completely okay with it, but the sophisticated computers that run our country and the banks can't handle it. <laughs> I was like, what What the fuck are you talking about? Right. I mean, to be fair, that wasn't the idea. The idea was all these things are on old tech, you know, old DOS type tech. There weren't enough digits. Isn't that right? There weren't enough digits. To yes, handle. that was the, and I was like, come on. Like that just, it seems. So it, that isn't true for your whole personal thing, computer. <laughs> the whole thing felt completely ridiculous. Like you were right, but I think you were wrong. I think your <laughs> reasoning like the, was wrong. Like you're saying I'm right, but I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, uh, that's funny. <laughs> so I want to talk about a lot of stuff related to Prince and related to this song. Uh, but I think that the reason that I chose it is because I think I grew up understanding 1999 to be a song about partying, like you're about to experience the turn of the millennium. (laughs) And when you actually hang out with the lyrics a little bit, which I was allergic to for whatever reason as a kid, you realize that this song is actually about the Cold War. It's actually about we're all going to die at any moment. So we might as well just party. This song is is all about at any second we're going to die. You know, this party's almost over. Oops, we're out of time. Uh, and, and there's a whole section at the end where Prince shifts his, you know, pitches his voice way up so that he sounds like a little kid. And he says, mommy, why does everybody have a bomb? And it's like happening over this as like kind of this groovy, funky rhythm and, and, and beat is sort of just lingering in this weird kind of tense and unsettling way like it's it's kind of left the party zone and it's entered more of a kind of like weird rhythm that that bleeds into little red corvette which by the way we're going to get into is just the greatest song and i think i now understand that this record and and certainly this song specifically but i think the entire record was about the the tension that that he and a lot of people were feeling at the time about we could explode at any given moment and i just gotta say relatable (laughs) 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 <laughs> there was this trailer for a new Alex Garland movie. Did you see this? I think it's called yes, Civil War. The Civil War, Civil yeah. War. And, uh, you know, if you, if you all haven't seen it yet, essentially it's it's what you think it is. It's, it's a big blockbuster movie about an American Civil War. And it's a little unclear from the trailer what exactly is, you know, underpinning everything because California and Texas are apparently allies in the movie. So it's, it's a little strange. But... I was very stressed out watching the trailer, <laughs> even though it seemed kind of stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and, and not a movie that I did. I like Alex Garland a lot, but not a movie I was going to be super excited for. I felt stressed out watching it because it felt just possible enough, <laughs> like just I, plausible enough. I think enough. that's what it's going for. Yes. Yeah. And so I think when I hear 1999 in the year 2023 and going into 2024, I feel the sense of everything's feels okay right now. Like the economy is seeming to be turning in a positive way. I feel like more and more people are becoming aware of the nonsense that has been happening the last several years. But also there's going to be an election in November. There are multiple wars uh, being fought in our world right now that feel like they are out of control and that I don't know what's going to happen between now and when we publish this, but at this present moment, everything feels very unsettled and unsettling uh, as a result. And, and so as I as I listen to 1999 now, it feels a lot like what I imagine it felt like to listen to this in the 80s, in the yeah. early 80s, uh, because this song and I think this whole album, there, there are songs, you know, there's a lot of songs about technology and, and a lot of songs about not being sure if you're going to be alive the next morning. There, there are you know, different ways that he gets at different things. And obviously he's doing it in a very Prince way, which I want to get into in a second. But as we enter a year that's going to be 
full of AI, right? Like we've spent so much of our brain spaces last year thinking about AI, especially as part of the leadership podcast. You know, there's AI on the top of our minds all the time. And it feels like we're just moving towards a direction that feels like uncharted territory and a little unpredictable. (laughs) And I feel this sense of dread, but also it's a new year. Let's have a party. That's fun. This is a fun time. I like... (laughs) I like the turn of the year. <laughs> I want to go celebrate, oh even God. though I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Yeah. But it's like, I've got so so many conflicting thoughts happening in my head right now as we're talking about this, because like in this song, it's always almost midnight. And the whole point of the yes, Cold War true, was true. it felt like it was always almost midnight, right? Yeah, fair. So what do you do when you put on the song? But then it actually becomes a bit you go to new. You know what I mean? It's like, like in real life are are going forward and you're going to go into the next year. So that's where it feels a little like, does it kind of deflate the impact of the song when you're like, oh, no, we actually have to keep moving forward. I don't know. I I, I will say I was also surprised when engaging with the song as an adult and you're like, oh, this song is about nuclear proliferation. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay then um but it does give it not surprisingly for anyone who like engages with prince as an adult after having grown up with him as a child a new depth yeah absolutely so i want to talk a little bit about that i know that we're going a little long on this part but but i, I just want to talk about prince prince is an artist who i wouldn't i'm not going to call myself a scholar of prince or like one of prince's biggest fans i came to prince pretty late in life i, I think growing up Prince felt both like a deviant <laughs> and, and, and like a sexual deviant who I either because of our church background or, or, you know, just being a kid in, in like small town, Iowa in the, in the eighties and nineties, Prince felt like weird, <laughs> like a little, <laughs> I didn't know what to do with him. He had this vibe, you know, I, I saw him on MTV with assless chaps. <laughs> Like performing yep. music, uh, you know there there were uh, there were concerts that I would I would see footage of where he's in a trench coat and a speedo, <laughs> like it's just a yes. very different vibe than I was used to. And he's got this very unique aura about him where he's very feminine, but he's actually he comes off as one of the more masculine men that I can remember experiencing in my life. But he's got this like gender fluidity and this this like feminine mystique thing going on that is very hard to, to put my head around even now that those things feel less out there you know like now that this is just kind of the the, the world we've lived in is has gone a different direction than where we were in the, in the 80s and 90s on on like yes. sexual spectrum um or like gender spectrums and so it feels a little less weird looking at it now but at the time it felt like what is happening <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't really know how to engage with that. I remember in the in the early '90s, you know, when he, uh, I my understanding is both because of a, a a personal reason and a professional reason, changed his name to a symbol and yes, was the artist formerly gonna, known as Prince. Yep. We just made fun of that relentlessly. We just thought it was the stupidest thing we'd ever heard, and it was very hard to find my way into his music. And I'm curious, and I eventually did. I want to talk about that too. But how did you experience Prince growing up? I mean, I, I very similarly, I mean, I think that I do think he's one of the first artists I ever, when I was listening to music, there's, a, there was obviously like Bowie and like some other artists before that pushed gender boundaries, I think in ways we probably underappreciate. Um, but I similarly like experiencing Prince in real time, you're like, oh, okay, you are like, you're singing about sex and you're clearly very hyper masculine, but also you change your name to a symbol that is clearly like a mix of the the symbol for woman and man you know and so my little conservative Oklahoma brain didn't know where to put that I mean that's what it comes down to I mean I so much appreciate Prince now obviously in retrospect and engaging with his music and and what he stood for and just the just just the artistry alone much less the like willingness to push those kinds of gender boundaries In the 1980s, in the Reagan era, this is, I don't even know, like just just his personality alone, like take the music away. This guy was magnetic. He would not have been able to get away, I think, with pushing those kind of boundaries if it wasn't for the magnetism of his personality and the artistry of his music. I read an article. I'm trying to remember what this was about. It was some kind of retrospective of a movie, I think, that was made. And it was a story about like, 
Prince meeting Matt Damon. Okay. And Matt Damon's just like casually trying to make conversation with them. And he says, so you live in Minnesota, huh? And Prince goes, I live inside my own heart, Matt Damon. (laughs) (laughs) What? (laughs) That's the kind of like, just not a, not a, not a, like on any kind of playing field that you and I are playing on. You know what I mean? (laughs) <laughs> Every interview I saw with him, it felt cryptic. And like he was in on a joke that we didn't know about. Yes, that's right. He had some, I, I, you know, Seven is one of my favorite Prince songs. Do you know Seven? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just an amazing song. Even in the 90s when when I was like unsure what to think about Prince, it was an amazing song. And that song, reading his lyrics does not seem to have a, a a central point of view. I don't know what he's saying there. And, and as I tried to understand more about it, it seems like anytime somebody asked about it, he just kind of had this sly smile and he was just unwilling to tell anybody what he was talking about, but it was clear <laughs> that he knew what he was talking about. And I think that's really, really fascinating. He just lived in his own orbit in, in a way that doesn't feel like he was crazy or anything. I and mean, people were so drawn to it. And he was such yeah. a captivating. He's certainly my my biggest, you know, the question is, who is the artist you wish you could have seen perform? He's certainly. Oh, my, my God. Answer. Dude could shred. Like, he was an amazing guitar player. And he just has, I don't know if you watched uh, in, during COVID, they released a concert from around the time that Purple Rain came out. His estate put it on YouTube for a limited amount of time. And. Uh, it was a real joy during COVID uh, to spend an afternoon watching Prince. You know, I, I was like getting work done. And I was watching this concert kind of in the corner of my eye and he's just so magnetic. Like his, the way that he owns the crowd. I remember watching him on the Super Bowl. I think the Super Bowl actually was a big reason why he became beloved to me. Like he was such an incredible performer out there in the pouring rain with his, with his purple guitar. And, and, you know, he just has this, incredible quality that that he felt so joyful and he felt and of course if if you i'm assuming everybody knows this but he, he's no longer with us uh, but he felt so joyful and, and so full of life so vivacious it was just a really singular person yeah i had a good friend in college who just adored prince and we spent many hours talking about him and i softened but i i felt like i couldn't quite find my way in i remember buying his album the rainbow children in college and like listening to it just as a way to like uh make her like me <laughs> and that's kind of this jazz fusion <laughs> record awesome. it's this first one where you know he's being called prince again and, and i've come to the understanding that it's not a beloved album but i remember thinking this is so cool and i didn't know enough about jazz fusion to understand was this good or not. I was just experiencing it as this feels so alive and, and, and so full of soul. And, you know, certainly latched onto him in the 2000s, watching that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame performance that everybody's seen, playing My Guitar Gently Weeps and having that incredible solo. And everything started clicking for me around, around then. And, and I don't know that I've totally reconciled how to is engage with his music lyrically. <laughs> I I think that there are still times where it feels risque in a way that, Makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I mean, I think it's fair to say sex is one of his favorite subjects. Uh, certainly. And he he is clearly attempting to shock. Yeah. His his goal is to shock. I remember learning that Darling Nikki is the reason that Tipper Gore went on her crusade that ultimately ended with those explicit tag, like those explicit stickers on albums and thinking like, of course it was Prince, like discovering <laughs> that it was Prince, that, that, that a Prince song made all of that happen made perfect sense to me. So I don't know if I've totally reconciled it, but I will tell you that when I listened to purple rain and, and sign of the times and the love symbol album and, Diamonds and Pearls and Around the World in the Day and Parade, those are all like masterpiece records. And and several of those are like now in my canon. And I think on a song to song basis, his top 20 songs are as incredible as any other band in history. He oh, is 100%. such an incredible, incredible musician. What where does this album fall on t- in terms of like your favorite Prince album? I think that I'd probably put this fourth, although I've spent so much time listening to it preparing for this episode that I've come to uh, find some new things to love about it that nice. I that I hadn't. Uh, there's a couple songs, AUT, O-Magic. I don't know if you pronounce that automatic or AUT O-Matic, but that song is, is is so fun. I think I was discovering the the kind of lineage 
of <clears throat> drum machines and synths in a way that this is going to sound like me making stuff up, but it kind of connected like Sly Stone to Radiohead. Like I, I felt ah. like this this kind of bridge between things that I love. I love Sly Stone. I love his soul music and, and his big party anthems and, and communal aspect of his of his music. And I love his growl. And Prince has all of those qualities. And of course, with Radiohead, I love their gorgeous chords and I love the the way that they play with drums and the way they play percussion and, and the way that they find these grooves and, and, and make music just by kind of messing around with them and continue to tweak and and and, and move elements around. And, and Prince was doing those things. And I think that Prince creates a template with this album that almost elevates drum machines to a, to a level where they're taken seriously by musicians. I, I bet there are a number mm. of electronic artists who had 1999 and listened to 1999 and were deeply influenced by it because a lot of the the things that he's doing here with these with these pre-programmed drums feel similar to things that I heard like Atekra or IFX Twin. Yeah. Obviously, it's not the same sound, but there's some some element to it where you take kind of this lifeless thing and you infuse something into it and you find this groove. So I would call 1999 my third favorite record now because I've just found new things. But Sign of the Times, number two, and Purple Rain. I kind of appreciate why people call Sign of the Times his best album, but Purple Rain start to finish. They're just like banger after banger, and I just yeah, want to like sing at the top of my lungs. And the song itself, like Purple Rain might be in a top, like it might be a top 10 song for me ever. And so... And the album that has Purple Rain on it is the album. Like if I had to choose one album to exist and all the other ones went away, I would choose Purple Rain. So <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be at least a top 10 karaoke song of everyone because you just can't, to your point, oh, not best. sing along with that. Yeah, man, for sure. <laughs> what is your relationship with Prince? Like, how do you, how has he fit into kind of your personal canon or your personal music journey? Yeah, I, it's been tough for me. I think similar to you, I had to find my way into him later in life. And I love a lot of his music. And I don't know that I've ever fell in love with an album start to finish yeah but i also don't know that i've tried that hard do you know what i mean mm. like there's just his library is insane like yeah it, it, i feel like when you think Almost about 40 prince, albums yeah. <laughs> oh, God. i feel like when you think about prince you think about a few key songs and albums from the 80s but actually his library stresses me out in terms of like <laughs> do you know what yeah. i mean sure um and so I think I've I've kind of settled on kind of those essentials playlists or kind of the top. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the bangers yeah. that everybody knows and they've kind of made their way into some of my some of my canon in terms of playlists, but never the albums. I just haven't really spent a lot of time. I think I've ran through Purple Rain a couple of times, you know, like kind of the the ones that everyone would know, but never had any special relationship with it. But I but I will say that one thing that I have. One reason I keep coming back to him is because we we cannot underestimate his influence. The people who have either t directly covered him, just put his songs on their albums, or made famous songs he wrote, like the one I'm thinking of is Sinead O'Connor, Nothing Compares to You. It, it's just like you you keep digging and you keep finding people that were inspired by him or worked with him. You know, like the, I, I think there's some like really obvious ones. Like I think about Lenny Kravitz coming up in the 90s. I think about mm. The Weeknd, you know, like just oh, some sure. people who like could not exist had Prince not carved the way. But man, I just he's one of those. I think we talked about this when we talked about Nina Simone, about like the more you pull back, the more you see how many people were actually influenced by her. Yeah. Like, I just feel like Prince is the same way. So like. When I hear all these people who, you know, just how beloved Prince was with them, and then all these people who are influenced by, I keep going, oh God, I got it. I've got to take the time to actually dig into this. And it's not until Dave puts a, you know an album on my radar for this podcast do I actually do it. <laughs> but hey, man, if you're going to choose a resolution for 2024, listening to more of his records in full, I believe that is a pretty good one. I believe that. 
I think this one, 1999 for me is kind of the beginning of the Prince sound that I most like his albums before this. There's a lot to recommend on them. There's a lot of good stuff, but the Prince that has captured a piece of my heart starts with 1999. The sound, obviously this is the beginning of the Minnesota sound. And like we talked about before this template for other music that comes after it. I think there's a lot of artists that we love like Eve Tumor. Yes. Who, who sounds, his sound is very similar to stuff you're going to find between like, 1999 and Sign of the Times, and maybe a little after Sign of the Times, around the world, maybe um, around the world in the day. Uh, I think that like LCD Sound System, when you listen to this song on this album, all the critics love you in New York. Uh, yes, tell me that James Murphy isn't Great trying song. to be like White Prince meets D. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> you could cut off all your hair. I don't think they care in New York. There's these beautiful moments on this record. There's these little synth chords at the end of Something in the Water that are so gorgeous. I just want to like isolate them and play them on repeat. There's obviously these like nine minute sprawling songs on this record. There's these huge dance party uh, song DMSR. And of course, Little Red Corvette, which is just, I think, the best song on the record. I think one of his best songs, full stop. And it is kind of the first song I can point to where somebody found a way to use synths and use pre programmed drum machines and infuse them with so much humanity and so much beauty that. It it turned them into a real instrument. It sounds super dated, right? Like it sounds like an album from the 80s. Yeah. But when I just listened to Little Red Corvette really loud in my car, it it feels still like a prescient album still an album from the future it's still an album that was ahead of its time and so certainly you know start with 1999 if you just need a way in it's a wonderful album and as far as an album to think about 2024 with where you might be optimistic but also fearing the absolute tornado of human rights (laughs) violations that may be coming (laughs) this is a decent enough soundtrack to get through the year it's interesting Ooh. to think about like you picking an album that basically defined the sound of the eighties, you know, yes. like I would say between this and maybe like in the air tonight by Phil Collins, like with both came out, I think at 82, right? Like inverted drum sound that mm-hmm. like drum machine mm-hmm. and that everyone just took and ran with for years and years and years in the eighties and became yeah. that like kind of definitive 80 sound. Who 81, 81 for in the air tonight. Ah, ah, it's close. It's, it's interesting to, to pair that with what we were talking about, about anxiety and kind of the the state of the world when you're con- turning into a new year. Because yeah. you're right, the Cold War was in on everyone's mind, 82. It's like been around for a while, obviously, but it was still with, with Reagan and his kind of blustering. And, you know, it's it's still on everyone's mind. There's only been a few times, I think, in our lifetime that have been similar in terms of kind of collective anxiety. I think about like after 9-11, right? Or, I mean, honestly, after Trump was elected, like there's, you know, like it's kind of paradigm shifting things. And I think we're kind of in one of those. I would call it kind of the post-pandemic anxiety and paradigm shift, where it just feels like everything is uncertain all the time now. Like we're all just holding our breath for the next pandemic or the next thing that's that's going to be really bad. So I'm empathizing, I think, a little bit with 1999 and like the state of, oh, we're all holding our breath waiting for midnight, I guess. Woof. Uh, Let's talk about your album. Yeah, that's quite a transition. We just went in, man. We just went in on that one. That was a fun conversation. Oh, yeah. But now now I feel like I'll depressed i'm like oh, that's not where you want to be well the good news is, is someday i'm gonna pick purple rain for something and we can just have a really fun conversation about prince awesome <laughs> and we can skip all the origin story and just talk about the beauty of the music i struggled with this i'll be honest because i felt like it's so subjective to has the year that you just had been shit and do you anticipate the next year also being shit you know like it's like to me whether you feel optimistic when you're going into the new year, it has a lot to do with where you're coming from, where you're going. 
And so similar to what you're talking about with 1999, I kind of wanted to find something that both could kind of have that dance energy that you would want going into New Year, maybe some optimism in it, but also some anxiety and maybe like something beneath the surface. So there was a couple couple albums that I was playing around with. I finally settled on In Color by the artist Jamie XX. I'll do a quick primer of Jamie XX if you are not familiar with him. He was a producer for the band The XX. But for this album, he really wanted to come out with a distinct sound and a departure from how the XX sounds. And if you know the XX, this was a pretty big departure. I mean, there's still some of the underlying kind of electronic sounds from the XX, but this gets a lot more electronic, a lot more dancey, a lot more um, just fun samples and beats. I really loved this when it came out. So this album came out in 2015, which again, now, now feels like forever ago. But this doesn't feel like that long ago for me because I think this is still pretty heavy in rotation kind of regularly for me. But one song that was just on repeat all summer after this came out is a song on here called I Know There's Gonna Be Good Times with Young Thug. Everyone I know loved this song when this album came out. And... It's a great song. And this is the one that made me think of New Year's Eve. It's like if you're looking for something optimistic that like, hey, where's this going to go? There's this great sample from the song Good Times by the Persuasions that gets repeated during the chorus here. It's just, I don't know, man. I don't know what to tell you other than that. We had this on in my office at the time and everyone was jamming to it. It was playing at every bar I went to. Um it's just it, when the chorus says, I know there's going to be good times, like everyone wants to play it when they want good times, you know? Yeah. And boy, do we want them. And boy, do we want them, especially on New Year's Eve. So that that definitely made me think of it. But then I was going back and revisiting kind of the songs on this album. It starts with a great electronic song, Gosh, which kind of repeats the, <laughs> repeats the chorus again. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> which is really fun. Also very could be apropos for going into a new year and not knowing what it's going to be like. It's got some more, I don't know about downbeat, but kind of poppy storytelling songs with some of the people from the XX, like Romy on the song Seesaw or Loud Places is one that I've listened to quite a bit. That's about kind of, you know, going to clubs, but feeling pretty lonely there and like missing people that you used to love. And so it's got it's got some tonal shifts too. It also made me think about it for the do I want this year or am I am I uh confident this year is gonna be good or not? But yeah, overall just really loved this album. It was one of the it was definitely a heavy repeat for me in 2015, but has been ever since too, for its kind of combination of electronic beats really kind of lo-fi hip-hop and just just a good time man so many kettle drums so many kettle <laughs> drums on this album it is a it's like uh dance parties in a jewel case it is i loved this record i still love this record it's interesting you're talking about good times because it's such an outlier on the record like i think it kind of is yeah yeah i think of in color as uh it has a lot in common with the XX's music. Like it, it still feels like kind of dark rooms and club atmospheres. It doesn't feel like big party anthems necessarily. It feels more interior than that. More. Yeah. Uh, there's another word I'm looking for, but whatever, that's fine. Uh, I listened to gosh on repeat for like two months straight when this came out. So good. I'm one of those guys who likes more bass in my headphones than autophiles or audiophiles are, are, 
happy about. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> gosh, the, the bass in gosh like rattles my bones and it feels so good. Uh, whenever I'm like trying out a new pair of headphones, it's one of the songs that I still reach for. And there's songs like OBS that is just so groovy. And it's got this like really fun, groovy line all the way through it. This is a great record and, and a great party record. Like a, a record if Dave was hosting a party at yes. his house for New Year's Eve. I would certainly be happy to throw on In Color for an hour and call it the soundtrack of the night. What's interesting to me about it is that he manages to get away from the very extremely introspective sound of the XX, but still somehow maintain those qualities in this more like dance hall vibe. You simultaneously kind of feel like you're sitting with a drink in a club or maybe about to go out on the dance floor, but also somehow alone or maybe wanting to leave that environment in some of these for some of these songs you know i think like loud places is literally about that like i yeah, go to these true. loud places and <laughs> but i want to leave them you know anyway i think that this is one of my favorite albums to put on as i'm going to a concert especially if i'm in a oh, cab with my headphones on i go to concerts by myself from time to time yeah, like it's like a palate cleanser I think on the way there, it just feels like it's getting me ready. It's warm, it's alive, it's vibrant, but it's still low key enough that I'm not overhyped for their concert. I'm just like ready to go do this really fun thing. Good. Did you spend any time with Romy's album this last year? No, I completely I missed it. It came out that same week that like James Blake and Royce and Murphy and all those other records came out. Yeah. And I kept meaning to go back to it. I think we've talked about how in the past that my relationship with the XX is kind of mixed. Like, I know that some people really love them. I've always just kind of found them okay. Like, I don't I don't find Oliver Sims or Romy's voices all that compelling. Like, they've all always kind of felt like, I don't know what else to say that except to have the old uh, Arrested Development quote, her? <laughs> <laughs> no. You're wrong. <laughs> oh, I'm prob- I'm sure I am. The XX is a very successful band that a lot of people love. But like, they're just, I, I love their, I-, I think what it is, is that I love the vibe and the sound more than the vocalists or the lyrics. Do you know what I mean? Like that, I've never yeah. actually felt that compelling. But like, I want to like them because I like the vibe. Does that make sense? Yes, I get it. Totally yeah. get it. I, I was into the XX when everybody was into the XX. It's not an album that has stuck with me. This album actually has stuck with me more yeah, than, than the ones that they the two that they put out that were pretty popular. Yeah, I mean, this one I've, I loved more than either of those records for the, all the reasons we just said. I mean, there's not, <laughs> maybe it's because there, there are only a few songs here that they even have lyrics. Like or, a lot of this is straight up electronic or dance. You are right that I know there's going to be good times is an outlier, but still a banger. Still, so much it fun. is. It is a banger. I don't want to deny it. it is. Yeah. It's bangerhood. <laughs> it's bangerhood. It's, banger it's bona fides as a banger. My honorable mention list is filled with records like this one, and not like 1999. Ah. <laughs> so I definitely, I think when I think of New Year's, I, I think about these types of records, uh, these kind of dance dance parties in a box. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Because I went straight to kind of my electronic, and I was like, I want that dancey vibe. Are we getting into honorable mentions already? I was looking at some Disclosure albums that I like, like the Alchemy album that came out this year, which was really good. I was like, I would play that on New Year's. We've talked about Passion Pit in the past, albums like Manners, which have some super optimistic songs, which I was like the vibe for like wanting to start something new. I felt like that was really a good one, but it wasn't quite dance enough for me, I think, for this particular use case. I was also looking back at some, I think uh, going deep into the catalog of like, okay, what other types of dance would I want? And I really wanted to throw on like Marvin Gaye, Marvin Gaye, what's going on or something. But then I realized, no, actually what I want is just the song got to give it up. Like, I don't even want, I don't even want any album. I just want that song, which is maybe one of my favorite things I would ever throw on a New Year's list. Yeah, it's fantastic. And then I was thinking about obviously some hip hop for the same kind of dance vibes, maybe some like old school, like late 80s De La Soul, like three feet high and rising would be an awesome thing to throw on in the background. Or (laughs) because I'm a 90s kid, 50 cents, get rich or die trying, which honestly, I just wanted the title of that album for New Year's more than anything else. Um, I think that is is also a common what I'm going to do this year goal. So, you know, that works really well. 
Nice. I, Drake's Take Care is another good one, another good hip-hop record that nice. uh, would work well at, at New Year's. I don't love Drake, but but that record's good. I was thinking about a bunch of LCD Sound System records. I guess Sound of Silver at the top of it, although I wouldn't necessarily say that is... Sound of Silver is interesting because I think it's the best front-to-back LCD Sound System record, but my favorite songs are scattered through their other records. So uh, I was thinking about Postal Services Give Up. As a potential oh, interesting. One. Yeah. Daft Punk, a couple of live albums, Daft Punk's Alive 2007 and Underworld's Everything Everything. Those two records are cool because they they kind of take all of their popular back catalog songs and they meld them together to kind of create new stuff out of them. So you kind of have two Daft Punk songs from different eras and, and they kind of not mash them together because... Uh, it's not like you're playing one over the other, but they pair them in a way and, and kind of make them flow in and out of each other, sometimes more than once, like in and out and in and out, in a way that is really exciting, really fun. So so check out Alive 2007 and Underworld's Everything, Everything, nice. DJ Cozy's Knock Knock, which interestingly is, I think the second half of Knock Knock is stronger, but the first half is like all party record. <laughs> and so that'd be a big one. DJ Healer's Nothing Too Loose, which is... A beautiful record from several years ago. And then uh, DJ Sprinkle's Midtown 120 Blues. That's also another amazing, amazing electronic record that would work well at New Year's. All right. What do you listen to this week, Caleb? You know, besides for going back and listening to every album you recommended on your top 10 list and trying to catch up on songs that and albums that I had not heard, thanks to you bringing them up last minute, his last minute, I actually genuinely did. That is not a joke. I went back and listened to There Will Be Fireworks. I went back and listened to more of Wednesday, trying to figure out what's so special. Why does Dave love them so much? Did you find it? Uh, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I officially moved them into my top 100 this week. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I again, don't fault you for that. I see the appeal. I just can't find it for myself, you know? Yeah. I also was going and listening to, to albums and just still questioning whether they should have been in my top 10. <laughs> like <laughs> Lorraine, I went back to listen to I Killed Your Dog, which is still a great album. Um, but I also, I don't know about what you were doing after we did that top 10 list. I felt a lot more free to just like make more playlists of individual songs. Mm. So I did make a playlist of my favorite hip hop songs and I've been listening to that. Like, did you remember Kendrick released like one song this year? <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, this song. So that was fun. That's probably what I've been listening to the most because it's just so, so much fun to put on the background. That's great. So I have continued to, you know, like you've discovered new things I wish I would have included on my top list from last year. The record by Over Mono called Good Lies that I just did not spend enough time with. And I saw somebody put it on a, a list. I said, oh, I forgot about that record. And I went back and listened to it and thought, oh, this is great. This is so much better than like five things I put on my <laughs> five things I put on my my list. So I guess I'll shout that one out this week. Over Mono, it's an it's electronic record. I don't know that I've spent enough time with it to be able to kind of wax poetic about it yet, but it just has a really nice vibe all the way through it. It's it's kind of easy to listen to. It the the beats per minute is not insanely fast. It is uh something you can kind of put on and have a chill experience, but it's not chill, like ambient music. Like it's, it's got a nice pulse uh, through it. And so uh, I would like to spend a little more time with that one. And, and then uh, another one was Kalela's album, but uh, oh, yeah, they that put that at number great. one. I was like, Oh, I forgot about Kalela. Uh, so all the regrets, I feel like this year, all of December, we're just going to be in that. I forgot about mode. Right. Apparently DJ Python put out a collaborative record called natural wonder beauty concept. I love Gigi Python. I follow him on Instagram. I have not seen it and hint that this album exists. <laughs> and yet here it was on this list. I was like, what? You got to so, wonder if like when we miss things like that, it was just bad timing. Like yeah. ended up putting it out on a weekend that kind of got drowned out by a bunch of other people putting out a bunch of other things. Yeah, maybe that's probably, that's probably right. Or like Dave was on vacation. <laughs> yeah. that, that How dare you once. release new music when Dave is on vacation. <laughs> Uh, man, I am looking forward to 2024 with you picking more albums. We have some fun guests too that we're hoping to bring in. So oh, yes, if you have ideas for future episodes, let us know. We're probably going to go to an every other week schedule here for a little bit. Uh, you'll notice that I've been kind of putting these out every other week, kind of figuring out how to integrate a 
uh, a passion project, a pet project into other responsibilities of life and work. I would love to keep doing these every week. I think every other week is probably the right rhythm <laughs> for for a little bit here. Yeah, fair um, enough. we still we still want to hear uh, from you every you know every possible topic that you want us to cover on the many years of best album four we have ahead of us, and of course. If you're into it, share it, please. Let your friends know about it because we would love to grow it and, uh, you know, have a reason to devote a little more time to it (laughs) this year. Just shamelessly self-plugging there. Please share this. (laughs) It's okay. No one's still listening. This is That's fair. We're an hour and 14 minutes. It's fine. (laughs) We talked about Prince for 54 of them. (laughs) (laughs) Which, you know, honestly, he deserves. He does. All right, man. This is fun. All right. May 2024 be ever in your favor. (laughs) 